I'm Lou Ciccone, the general manager of the All the Kings Men Chess Store in Michigan. We're the largest store in the Midwest. And uh, today we, we have Ben Feingold, who is an international master, the highest rated player in Michigan history, in the top 20 players in the United States. And he's going to be playing six of our players uh, blindfold in a simul today. So I guess we're ready to get started on board one. So before anybody says any move, which will just be you, yes. always say the board number. Okay. Don't ever say move. Say board one this board move, board two this move. Right. When, when, when the board next to you moves and I move, then you guys got to move. Okay. So on board one. Okay, board, yeah, board one, D4, David four. Board two, knight F3. Board three, D4. No, board four, it's your turn. On board four, E4. Okay, E5. On board five, E4. E4. E5. On board six, E4. E4. C5. On board one. Board one, there's a board one? Oh, okay. <laughs> But that's what the master does, or the blindfold player. He doesn't put a blindfold on. He sits there with his back to the people that he's playing, and then the people are seated behind him, uh, facing him. And uh, there were six of them. What we saw today was a grandmaster player with a nearly photographic memory. He visualizes it as if a camera was looking down, as if he was looking through a camera that's looking down moving from board one to board two to board three to board four to board five to board six and he sees himself like he's looking down at himself physically making the moves on the chessboard he says he can see each board exactly as if he were looking at it in fact i've noticed that when ben plays his tournament games i believe that a lot of times there's a lot of distracting things there might even be glare from the board and so a lot of times you'll notice that during his games, even in very complicated positions, he'll close his eyes and calculate. And he seems to be more undistracted when he does that. He can like see the board very clearly in his head and think about it that way and that that's almost easier for him. Because you know, when his eyes are open, he's distract. his eyes can be distracted by any other things that are going on and also his mind can wander off. But when he closes his eyes and just thinks about the chessboard, it seems to be easier for him to make you know, calculations. What he's doing, actually, he's also visualizing himself writing down the moves on a score sheet, just like as if he was sitting at the board and playing you in a tournament game. So when he makes the move, he, it's like he's writing down E4 on his score sheet. In a normal rated uh, tournament, uh, everyone has to keep score of their game. They have to use the algebraic notation, which is the letters A through H and the numbers 1 through 8 for every square on the board, and you write down how the pieces move uh, in the game on your score sheet, which basically is a, a tally sheet. You write down all of your moves and all of your opponent's moves, and both of you do this. And the reason is that if there's any dispute during the game, that is considered the legal record of your game. And so a tournament director has something to refer to in case there's a dispute and the score sheet can settle it. And you notice that several times he kind of forgot where some pieces were. And in order to find out how it was set up, he goes back to his mental score sheet of the game. And then he like plays it back like a videotape recorder or like a computer. You know how you can go on the computer, you can have a game played by a grandmaster, and all you have to do is just keep clicking the buttons and the computer will quickly make the moves. Ben is doing that exact thing in his head. And of course, as you saw, we had that one incident where the guy did not make the correct moves on his board in front of him, even though we made them correctly there and we took what Ben said correctly, but you know, that's good, not good enough. We had to make sure that the man was making the correct moves on his board too. But who fixed it up? Ben did. So when I played F4, he thought I played bishop F4. Is right. that what happened? I guess so, yeah. yeah. So my bishop should be on G5, right? Right. right. Okay, now hold on. Then this was, this was after he played like C4 or some move, some, some pawn push. Okay, so put his bishop back on B5. Let's go back to that position because we shouldn't be hanging everything because he doesn't own the position. 
Put, put the bishop back on b5. b5. Yeah. Okay. Put my king on h5. Okay. Now, when he played rook f7, this is when I played f4. I believe so. Right. And then he played bishop d7, but he thought I played bishop f4, and then right. he played bishop d7. Right. So put his bishop back on b5, put my pawn on f4, okay. put my king on h5, right. and it's his move. Okay. And let it, go to his board, do that too. Yeah. <laughs> He's replaying the score sheet and could go back, play through every single one of those games, all the moves exactly, right to the end, mm -hmm. and analyze them as he's going and tell you what you should have done here or what was better here, or like he said with Jeff, what was dumb that he did and what he should have done there. I thought when I play here, if you go here, I go here, and you lose a piece. Right. And I have this here. But you play this, and I get threatening a seven check. And I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and I looked at this, I looked at this, because you're losing a piece here. You're, but, right. But, like four, I mean, all my blunders in the same game. Oh, good game. game. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Nice. If you also notice that while we were playing, he didn't always go right from one board to the next. Sometimes he was so caught up in the position on board one that he wasn't physically, mentally ready to move to board two. And so you could hear him say things like, well, I'm not there yet, or whatever, you know. So, you know, and that's because he's actually got to mentally visualize himself doing it. And until he's mentally ready to do that, then it's not going to happen. But at the beginning, he purposely set it up a certain way. And he did it that way because for him, that was the easier way to remember each board. Differences, that's what he needs. If he has differences between each board, so in other words, one, two, three, he was playing one color, and four, five, six, he was playing the other color. And the things he said, like, I want, in, I want them in, basically, I want them in strength by, like, descending order. He was, he was born with uh, a tremendous gift of memory. He was born with a tremendous um, ability to play this game. And then you take the fact that his whole family, his father was a master at 14, his brother was, is a master, and so the whole family has been involved with chess forever. They, they've always thought it was a good thing. And uh, so you get that tremendous drive and passion and talent, and then you put in some training and this is what can happen. You're really watching a once in a lifetime thing. There's 800 grandmasters in the world. Ben is like in the top 300 players in the world. But I bet that most of those guys can't do what we saw Ben do here today. This is a phenomenon. We think the chess does great things for kids. I mean, it's just inspirational. And I was especially surprised, actually, that Jeff was the one that played the really super great game. He was a competitive golfer before he came to chess, and it shows in his game. You can see his fight, how he really wanted that. And when, you know, when, he, when, he, when he slammed that piece down on the board, and he meant it. Obviously, what he did is, is fantastic. I mean, any time you can get a draw against a grandmaster in any situation, I don't care if he is blindfold, uh, that's a fantastic achievement. Uh, all of these guys are, uh, the adults anyway, are experienced uh, tournament players. You know, they've probably played in, oh, 10, 20 tournaments at least. Uh, probably been playing chess uh, seriously for at least, you know, two, three years, maybe more than that. Ben has been Michigan chess. Uh, you know, since he was probably 13, 14 years old. Um, he was the superstar. Um, everybody knew, you know, when he was a young boy, when he was like, uh, when he was six, he was the state champion, six-year-old, first grader. Um, so they knew there was something special, but you know, there's a lot of kids that are state champion first graders, but then they go away from chess. They don't necessarily continue. Sometimes I almost think that success at an early age they say, oh, no big deal about chess, so now I'll move on to something else. So, you know, um, but Ben, when he was nine, um, started going to uh, the chess clubs in the area, like the Oak Park Chess Club. He would go downtown. He would play in, in Hart Plaza against the Hustlers. It's almost a story like the Josh Waitzkin searching for Bobby Fischer story. Only Ben was, um, his dad, uh, drilled into him that the only way you're going to become a good player is you have to play the other good players. And as Ben told us, uh, he would go to his first tournament, he would lose all nine games he would play, and but he would come back. 
Now, most kids, when they go lose games like that, a lot of them, they just turn away from the game. But Ben would not, and also his father wouldn't let him. So he would come back, he'd lose nine games again. He'd come back, he'd lose nine games again. But he kept doing it. And eventually, he started taking draws off those good players. Then he started beating them. By the time he was nine, he was probably beating them. By the time he was 12, they, can, they all considered him extremely dangerous, all the, even the strong experts and masters in the state. They knew that this was the kid who was going to take them someday, even if it was not today. But then at 13, he was just uh, tremendous. You know, uh, he really increased his strength. And um, 14 again, and then 15, or well, 14, he was a master. 14, he finally cracked the 2200 barrier. Um, 15, 16, he was one of the best players in the country at, at his age group. Um, as, he, as he went on, he eventually got, uh, uh, by the time he was 20, he was an international master. Um, and that made him probably the best player in the state at that time, and that was 15 years ago. He also won the Samford Fellowship, which is the most prestigious fellowship that if you're under 21 that you can win. He went to Europe, and in the late 80s and 90s, uh, between about 1988 and 1994, he went to Europe, and he, and he got his international master title, and many people thought he was, you know, well on his way to getting the grandmaster title, and became a grandmaster. He would be the first grandmaster in Michigan history, mm -hmm. so that would be something to trumpet about. When I was a kid, um, I was interested in everything. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, I guess in a way I was a little bit of a problem because my mom was always afraid, even though I never expressed that I was bored, she was always afraid that that was going to happen. She was always afraid that uh, I wasn't going to be kept interested enough. So I would play any game, and she would show me any game, and I would quickly learn it, and I would master it, and I would beat everybody in the house, and then I would go on to the next thing. So she heard about this other kid, and she went over to the mother's house, and she said, you know, what do you do to keep Ricky interested? And she said, well, I just learned about this new game that he's learned called chess. If I lost in any game that I played, you see some kids here now, and I've had them, that are just terrible. They, they just throw all kinds of tantrums. Uh, they're like, you know, they just don't know how to handle losing or winning. <laughs> and uh, I was terrible. I mean, I, I threw the absolute worst tantrums of all time. So I needed to find something that was going to teach me how to lose with dignity. And that is what chess did for me. Because I learned right away that it didn't matter how smart you were or how much you studied it. You could spend your whole life with it, and you're still going to lose games. I just feel this, this game has done so much for me, and I've seen what it does for my students. You know, it changes lives, and I've been really happy with that. And we're, we've put a vision together which is to, you know, get chess out to as many kids as we possibly can. It, it makes you believe that, well, if I can do this, then maybe I can focus better on my other school subjects. Chess, you know, you have to be logical, and, you know, you have to try to make uh, objective decisions, and that's going to help you in life. That's what I think it does for a lot of these kids. We've had kids who are ADHD or they have... Um, you know, maybe they get C's and D's in their school classes, and then we start teaching them chess, and things change much for the better. And so we, we're convincing more and more parents and teachers and educators that uh, chess is not just a game. It can actually change these kids' life for the better. We'd actually like to have chess in every school curriculum. We had a kids' tournament yesterday. And the parents come up to me and say, wow, you know, this is, this has just done great things for my kid. And the teachers say the same thing. Like I said, what really is gratifying is when you hear a story about a kid that, like, has bad behavior problems or he has emotional problems. He has uh, uh, trouble with attention deficit. Um, and then you hear that it's changed his life for the better. These are the things that make it all worthwhile.